Shalom, friends. Welcome to the Shi'ur in Talmud, the Oral Law. Today we're studying Masechet Brachot, Tractate Blessings. We're making use of the Korean Talmud Bavli, as you can see in front of you. I'll tell you a bit about it in a moment. I'm Eliyahu Shir from Chesed Ve'emet, my website, www.lovingkindness.co. As always, I remind everybody, either at the beginning of the year or at the end, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so. Please click on the subscribe button underneath this video. You'll be a member and a partner in my team. And uh, click on the bell button to be notified of future Shiurim. So here we are. We're making use of this beautiful edition in front of us, the Korean Talmud Bavli, in which we can see the original text in the middle of the page. And we also see the translation next to it, together with the notes to help us understand the translation. We also see some additional notes on the side of the page, together with halach halachot, biographies, diagrams, and photographs, and illustrations, and all sorts of things that really help us understand the page better. So for those of you who are following with me, please feel free to follow along on the notes as well. And if there's anything that I miss out on, please inform yourselves about it. And if I say something that's not 100% in accordance with what is being said here, please do read it and take in all the knowledge that you can get if I've missed out on something. Now, we're actually on page Duff, Chaf Base Amud Aleph. We're about to start page 22a. But I have, before the shiur begins, I have gone backwards to where we began our discussion. Remember, when we're studying Talmud, we must never forget where the root of the discussion is coming from. And the way of the Talmud is that we have a Mishnah, and then we have the Gemara. We have the Mishnah, which is the essence of the Halakha, and then we have the Gemara, which describes the Mishnah in much more detail, elaborating on all the necessary points to help us understand what the Mishnah is about, adding Agadita, the Agada, the storyline, the homiletical part of the Torah, the Midrash part of the Torah, the stories. And that's what really makes up the Gemara. Now, every time we encounter a new section within the Gemara, we always go back to what the Mishnah was saying, and we then elaborate on that. So if we were studying it as a page together before, and we were just working our way through very quickly, we'd know what the Mishnah was. But in our case, because the weeks have gone by, and we might have forgotten what the Mishnah is about, let us just do a quick recap of what the Mishnah was, what our discussion is, and now we can continue backwards on to where we had left off in the previous week, in the previous lesson. The Mishnah said as follows, again, you can never get enough of the Mishnah. You can repeat the Mishnah 1,000 times. Don't worry about uh, excess of time spent on learning the Mishnah. We did it already. Don't worry about it. It's necessary to go to the Mishnah 1,000 times. So you're losing out on nothing, and neither am I. Baal Keri, says the Mishnah, a man who had a seminal emission. He's called a Baal Keri, very famous um, part of Halakha, part of the Jewish law as to what happens to this man because he puts himself into a state of ritual impurity. The Mishnah tells us that he may think in his heart and he may not make a blessing, which means to say he may think what? He, of course, if we're reading all the commentary, etc., we know exactly what it's talking about. It's talking about the recital of the Kriyat Shema. He may think the Kriyat Shema in his heart, as we see here, he contemplates the Kriyat Shema in his heart. The enormous and he may not make the blessing. We make blessings before the Kriyat Shema and after the Kriyat Shema. Those who have joined us for the previous Shirim will know that there are blessings that we recite before reciting Kriyat Shema and blessings that we recite afterwards. So at this point in time, the Mishnah says you should only think the Kriyat Shema in your mind if you're a Balkari, if you're in a ritually impure state because of a seminal emission. And one should only think in one's heart the brachot, sorry, and one should only, and one should not make the blessings before or afterwards. That's at this point in time, the Mishnah says, think the Kriyat Shema, do not write, recite the blessing before, do not recite the blessing afterwards. The Al Hamazon, what about blessing on one's food? It's, it's a positive mitzvah in the Torah. If we eat a bread meal, we must bench, we must thank God for the food that we've eaten in accordance with the prescribed formula of prayer as given to us by the Chachamim of that period of time, going back to the Anshay Knesset HaGadayla, the men of the Great Assembly. Va'al Hamazon, so the law is as follows. What about benching when we recite the thanksgiving of the food after we've eaten? Mavarek you should make the blessing afterwards, says the Mishnah. 
But don't make the blessing before. In other words, to make the blessing on the food before. But don't make, but you can make the blessing afterwards, no problem. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda says, According to Rabbi Yehuda, he may make the blessing before and afterwards. Now, in other words, he may make the blessing of Hamotzi and he may also make the blessing of the after eating and in both in both the case of the Shema and in the case of food you may make the blessing before and the blessing afterwards now the Gemara went to great depth describing the situation of the Balkari and what he's really allowed to do and what he's not allowed to do and so on and so forth now at the end of the discussion we actually came to a conclusion that said that you know something Rabbi Yehuda also believes in the concept of a Balkari of a man who had a seminal emission, that he too is not really entitled to engage in words of Torah. And therefore, it was difficult to understand why Rabbi Yehuda had said in the Mishnah that whether we speak about before or afterwards, he may make all the necessary blessings. And it wasn't a problem. Because even Rabbi Yehuda held by the idea of a Balkari being uh, penalized, if we can say it that way. He has to lose out that he may not recite these holy words of the Torah, which require a state of purity on one's body. And how do we get that state of purity? As we discussed before, he, we would have to follow the, the, uh, the, um, the decree of Ezra, the scribe, who said the moment that a person has a seminal emission, he must then go to the mikvah and he must purify himself so that he can continue studying Torah. But as we know, this can be a great inconvenience. Uh, one can only imagine in, in men in a state of ritual impurity and they're being told, look, we're very sorry, but you can't study any Torah until you go to the mikvah. Well, the mikvah is locked at the moment or it costs a lot of money to go to the mikvah. I can't afford it. Or uh, it's quite an inconvenience for me to get to the mikvah and get back. And by the time I get there and get back, and the next thing you know, one of two things, of course, would happen. Either men would not be intimate with their wives because even being intimate with one's wife is also uh, release of the of the semen and that would also create the ritual impurity so whether it was that there was no vessel or there was the vessel it doesn't make a difference how the semen exited the body for what purpose the person is in the state of ritual impurity so this whole decree of Israel is difficult to understand now Rabbi Yehuda does hold by the decree and he still holds that a person who is in a position that he, he ha he's a Balkari and didn't go to the mikvah he shouldn't engage in words of Torah so that is the conclusion that we came to at the end of our last discussion, where at the end it said, Lord Tamer Mavarek, don't think that what we were referring to when Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda said that you, you may make the blessing, that he really meant making the blessing as in the, saying the words, maybe what he really meant is that one may think the blessing. Because in any case, a person should keep in mind that although... Um, that the speech and the thought is not considered like speech. We have a principle that thought is not considered like speech, but nevertheless, there are certain instances where if a person cannot speak, he may certainly think. A practical example of that would be if a person was, uh, Rahman al he was in the state, he was about to die, and he didn't have the energy to speak, he couldn't do vidoy, he, didn't do, he couldn't do confession, and he's not able to say anything, he can't even do anything, can't move. But in his mind, he's able to think. Then even though the teshuvah, which is the ideal teshuvah, is one that involves speaking, asham nu, bagad nu, gazal nu, and the person starts uh, clapping on his chest and he says, I sinned in this way and I sinned in that way. Oh God, please forgive me for the sins that I've committed in my lifetime. You know, uh, 10 minutes before he's going to die, can stand him in good stead that when he dies, all of the teshuvah will be accepted. As we know that if a person goes throughout his whole life and he's involved in all sorts of activities he shouldn't be involved in, but he does teshuva at the last minutes of his life, his teshuva is accepted. It's not the greatest level of teshuva. The greatest level of teshuva is when a person is young and he doesn't engage in the averis. But a person who gets older and then he, real, he realizes the moment before he dies that he should do teshuva. So he says to himself, let me do teshuva. He says, Asham nu, bagad nu, gazal nu, Hashem, I sinned in this, I sinned, sinned in that, I regret it. I wish I hadn't have done it. Uh, please forgive me for these things. Then we know that his teshuva is accepted. That is what it teaches us in halakha. But what about a person who can't speak? Well, if he can't speak, does that mean that his opportunity to do teshuva has been lost? No, not necessarily. Although it is not the highest level of teshuva, a person should be aware. He should at least think in his head 
that he's doing teshuva. In his mind, he should say to himself, Asham nu bagad nu gazalu. He should say the words in his mind if he can. And if he can't remember the text, he should say in his mind, God, please forgive me for the things I've done wrong. Or even think in his mind, God, I forgive those who have hurt me in my life. Please forgive me these moments before I'm going to die and I'm going to enter into the next world and there's going to be a din Torah against me. There's going to be a din of the Torah that's going to come to me and say, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. So at that point in time, please forgive me now. I'm still thinking the words. So the words also have an effect. Even though they're only in thought, they also have an effect. Therefore, isn't it true that it's fair enough to say that Rabbi Yehuda was not saying mevareich, that he should actually say the words, because he also holds by ritual impurity, the person's not pure, he should also not recite those words of Torah, the blessings before and the blessings after, etc. But rather, he should think the words and not recite them. Good, now we continue. Umi is Leil Rabbi Yehuda Hiror. Obviously, the way of the Gomorrah, as we know, is not straightforward. And the first thing that the Gemara does when it sees a statement that seems a little bit uh, skeptical, uh, what, what should we say about this thing? Rabbi Yehuda says, Maharher, but he, didn't he say, he said, Mavarei, he didn't say Maharher. Why do you make up such stories? Or me, it's like Rabbi Yehuda, he, who, is there to Rabbi Yehuda thinking? In other words, does Rabbi Yehuda really hold by thinking? And maybe he doesn't hold by thinking. He holds by speaking. And speaking is what counts, not thinking. Oh, of course, I just gave a, a lovely discussion about the idea that a person can think, and thinking certainly takes an effect. But let's not forget, when it came to Rabbi Yehuda, he didn't hold by thinking. What do you mean? Vahatanya, it wasn't a taught in a brighter, which means to say that if, if you want to know the story about Rabbi Yehuda with regards to thinking and speaking, I'm going to tell you a brighter. There's another teaching somewhere which is as strong as a Mishnah, just that it wasn't put into the Mishnah. It's as strong as a Mishnah in its essence, but it wasn't actually codified into the Mishnah itself. And what did it say in the brighter? It said, Balkeri she'ein lo ma'im litbol, a person who is uh, in a state of the ritual impurity because he had a seminal emission, one who experienced a seminal emission, she'ein lo ma'im litbol, and he has no water to immerse himself in. There's no mikvah available. What should he do? The brightest is he may read the Kriyat Shema. The enormavare, but he may not make the blessing. Lo lefaneha, the lo lacharia. Not exactly in the, exactly the words of the Mishnah, which said that he should think through the Shema and then he shouldn't make the blessing before and after. Here it says he should actually say the Kriyat Shema itself, but don't make the blessing before or after. Continues. The oichel pito, he can eat his bread. O mevarek lacharia. And he may make his blessing afterwards, the Birkat Amazon. But he shouldn't make the blessing before. Fine, granted, you know, the blessing that we make after eating is completely different to the blessing that we make before eating. After eating is a mitzvah doraisa. It is a positive mitzvah from the Torah. It's a Torah mitzvah. You should do it. But the mitzvah that we do before that of the bracha before is only mitzvah de Rabbanan, meaning that the rabbis instituted blessings before we eat our food. But the, but, but the mitzvah of benching after eating bread, well, that's a clear mitzvah in the Torah. You shall eat and be satisfied and thank and, uh, and, bless, the, and bless Hashem your God. Therefore, it's correct to say that one should indeed make a blessing afterwards. But then it says over here, that was the question that we were asking. This is what the Bryson was saying. But he should think it in his heart. So the idea is as follows. In instances where he may not recite the blessing, so even though that's the general principle, in the instances when he cannot, he may think it in his heart, but he, he, shouldn't, he shouldn't say the words with his lips. Rabbi Meir. These are the words of Rabbi Meir. Ah, that's what the brighter says. But the brighter continues. Rabbi Huda Omer, Rabbi Huda says, ben kaku ben kach, whether this or that one, whichever one we're talking about, even though he's a Balkeri, indeed, he may say the words of the benching and the brochas and all the different things. No problem. Which means to say, according to, you see the note over here, Rabbi Yehuda does not consider contemplating the blessings in his heart a solution. 
and permits them to be recited not in accordance with what we learned above, where it said, Lo Rabbi Yehuda Hirhud. Does he really hold by Yehuda? No, he doesn't hold by Hirhud. Rabbi Yehuda does not hold by thinking. How do we know that? From this brighter. This brighter says that Rabbi Yehuda says, say the words. Even though Rabbi Yehuda also holds by the Balkiri and he should go to the mikvah, he should follow the, the takana, the decree of Ezra, etc. Omer Rav Nachman bar Yitzchak. So the answer is like this. Rav Nachman, the son of Yitzchak, said, you know why Rabbi Yehuda said that you may recite these words of the blessings, etc. The answer is, Asa'an Rabbi Yehuda The reason is that Rabbi Yehuda made these words that we recite of the blessings like the laws of Derek Eretz. A Derek Eretz applies to general laws pertaining to general conduct. General conduct is Derek Eretz. Many people maybe heard the saying which we say, Derek Eretz Kadma Latera proper behavior preceded the Torah, which means before a person receives the Torah, he has to get his midot in line with what they should be, the attributes. But before a person gets involved in the study of Torah, he's got to get his system working correctly. If he can't get his system working correctly as a human being, the words of Torah are dangerous to a person. The analogy is given, for example, of uh, what do we say that the study of what do we say Torah does to a person? Torah doesn't make a person better, unfortunately. Torah makes a person more of what the person is. For example, the analogy is given. If we take grass and we water the grass, what do we get? The grass, the grass begins to grow. It's better. If we take flowers and we water the flowers that are very small, what do we get? We get nice, beautiful flowers coming up. Well, if we, if we water shrubs and uh, various weeds and things like that, what do we get? We get bigger weeds, of course, and bigger shrubs and bigger clumsy type of things. This is the Torah. The Torah is water to the soul. When we work on our attributes correctly and we refine ourselves and then we put the water on, then, of course, we become greater because that's what water does to us. It makes us grow to become greater. If, however, our attributes within ourselves are already negative, we're nasty, we're jealous, we're angry, and we study Torah, what becomes of us? You know what becomes of us? We become more angry. We become more jealous. You say, how does that work? I'll tell you. The answer is, when a person engages in Torah, he begins to find reasons for the behavior that he engages in. The Torah is amazing. In the Torah, you can find reasons for doing anything. And if, for example, you want to be jealous of somebody, you will find a verse in the Torah that will allow you to become jealous of somebody because the, the Torah says that jealousy, for example, even increases wisdom. I mean, we know that uh, for, if a person sees a Torah scholar and they're doing very well, so then a person becomes jealous of them. So you say, but you shouldn't become jealous. He says, you know, it's not true. Jealousy is a good attribute because I see that Torah scholar is very great. And now I'm jealous because he's so great. I want to become as great as he is. So he uses jealousy because he sees that there's an opportunity that the Torah gave him to become jealous. If a person wants to become angry, so the Torah says, the Torah might say something like, if you see a person who is going off the path, I mean, I, I mean really negative things, maybe you're entitled to hate this person. And I'm talking about in the general sense of a person who is a, a mature person. I'm not talking about a Balteshuva now and he went off the path, yeah, and he comes back. And he, uh, we're talking about a person who's really a, a nasty person. And he's totally off, totally off the derech, as we say, in an, in an, evil, in an evil path. And they say, you know, step, step away from him. So then all of a sudden the person says, you see, I can become angry. The Torah gave me permission to become angry. Now that's not true. Neither does the Torah give permission to become jealous. Neither does it give the permission, a person permission to become angry. What it's telling you is when you have a particular attribute and it's bothering you, at least use it in a good way. Don't use it in a negative way. But the catch is that the Torah is only water upon the whatever it is that it's watering. If it's weeds that it's watering, you get bigger weeds. If it's flowers that you're watering, you get more beautiful and bigger flowers coming up. Therefore, we say that behaving correctly is what preceded the Torah. Before you get to a stage of receiving the Torah, you have to be in balance as a decent, um, a decent person. And indeed, when the Torah was given, let us not forget for a second that the one thing that brought us to have the Torah is that the Jewish people were united. It was the only time ever 
that the Jewish people were united in the fullest sense possible, that is why they received the Torah. You can only receive the Torah when you're united com completely. When the Jewish people are united as one, that means to say there is no fighting amongst one Jew to another, no, not one, not one Jew fighting towards another. Then the Jewish people can receive the Torah at Har Sinai and God's voice can be heard. The Ten Commandments can be given and there's thunder and lightning and fire and clouds and smoke and all sorts of things going on. Miracles and um, letters that are floating in the air and, and the voice of God being able to be heard from one side of the world to another. Miracles beyond miracles occur. When? When we all unite as one. Which means to say, when we have Derek Eretz, we can receive the Torah. Derek Eretz Kadmala Torah. Now, According to this, why, uh, why did I do a, uh, why did I just go off the path and I'm speaking about Derek Eretz is because Rabbi Yehuda said that the brachot that we recite in benching are really brachot considered in the category of Derek Eretz. Meaning to say, we put it into the same category. It's not in the fullest sense of the powerful words of Torah, but rather in the sense of Derek Eretz. Would it be permitted for me to learn some work of Musar to improve myself, even though I didn't go to the mikveh yet? Seems to be that if it's just working on myself, that I could engage in. But to engage in actual words of the Torah, to study the Chumash and to study the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim and the Mishnah and the Gemara, perhaps it's not appropriate to engage in that if a person is a Balkari, but to involve oneself in Derek Eretz, well, that would be all right. Study what it means to be a decent person, even if you're a Balkari. However, if you want to study Torah proper, make certain you're in a state of ritual purity. Therefore, it could be that the reason that Rabbi Yehuda said that not that, he, that you should think these brachot, but in fact, you should say the brachot, is because he holds that the brachot should be in the same category of the concept of Derek Eretz, and therefore it's, per, it's permitted, it's, per, it's permissible, it's permitted. The Tanya, as it was taught in a bright, as it was taught in a brighter, another brighter. What does the brighter say? And you shall make them known to your children or to your sons and to the children of your children or the sons of your sons. And it is written right afterwards. If you read there, you see it says Deuteronomy 4.9 and immediately afterwards Deuteronomy 4.10. Immediately afterwards it says, On the day that you stood in front of Hashem, your God, at Chayrev. What does that mean? You teach your children and to your grandchildren, etc. And afterwards it says, on the day that you stood in front of God, your God, uh, at Chorev, which means at Har Sinai. Chorev is simply another name for Mount Sinai. Ma lahalan, just as it is that later on, which means to say, when you were standing to receive the Torah, was ba'ema or ba'yira, it was with fear and or awe or and fear, and also with the quaking and a trembling. So too over here, in our case, when we're engaged in Torah, real Torah, we must do so in a manner of awe and fear with the quaking and trembling and whatever you translate these words, meaning absolute uh, awe of God. But when we study Torah, we must engage in the study in a state of respect, of awe. It is insufficient to engage in Torah as if we were playing with a toy. We don't just play with a toy here. We are engaged in the words of God. God says to us, this is the law. God says to us, this is the way to behave. God says to us, this is the mysteries of the Torah. Wow, wow, this is, hold on a second. This is the mystery of the Torah. This is, this is God's word. Imagine the king is giving us, for example, the king is giving us a, um, an instruction and the, the letter arrives by the prince or the messenger of the king when we receive it how do we receive the letter of the king you know what we receive it in our pajamas uh, the letter comes to us we're sitting in our pajamas in bed oh, what's the king got to say well, it's coffee bring the coffee over and let's have some toast and coffee let's just see what the king's written on this on this piece of paper over here. Shame. Nebach, poor fellow, felt he had to write me a letter. Let me take the time that I've got over here while I'm trying to just get out of bed and see what this fellow has to say to me. No. When the letter of the king comes, we dress in our finest garments. We make sure our hands are clean to hold the letter. We're ready for it in the best possible manner with absolute respect. But when we receive the Torah, when we are studying Torah, even as we're doing right now, and any time that we open up any page of Torah and begin to learn it, we say to ourselves, this is the letter of the king. The king has given to us a letter of life, of how to behave in life, 
of what to do with ourselves. And in it, not only are instructions of law, in it are instructions of life, in it are instructions of the mystical side of what life is all about, of who God is. This is an amazing work. This is, re this is a letter beyond any letter that any king has given to anybody. Therefore, when we read it, when we're involved in it, we need to be very serious about it. Therefore, from what we're learning over here, when a person is engaged in Torah study, when he says the words of the Torah with his mouth, he says, the, pronounces the words, he needs to do so with absolute respect. If he's a Balkiri, if he had the seminal emission, so then he is in a state of impurity. It's like he just got out of bed in the morning, he's still wearing his pajamas, and he's having his uh, coffee and, and toast. He's having a good time. Now, what he needs to do to respect what things are all about, he needs to go to the mikvah. He needs to purify himself, and then he can receive the Torah in a state of awe and trembling. He's really motivated now. He respects what the Torah is. And so, therefore, when Rabbi Yehuda said it was permitted to say the brachot, he was obviously saying that he equated the brachot that being recited here to the idea of Derek Eretz, which means everybody can engage in it, even if a person isn't in a state of ritual purity. Mikan Amru. From here, they said, the sages said, Hazavim, the, those who had an emission of semen, but that is not the normal type of emission that we're talking about. It refers to a type of a sickness, let's say, maybe it's gonorrhea, who knows what it is. He has a type of a sickness whereby the semen leaves the body. Vahamatsuraim, and also those who are Matsuraim, leprous people, and therefore they're also in a state of impurity. And those who have relations with women who are in nida, a terrible thing to do, right? Because this is forbidden by the Torah. A man and woman may not be intimate at the time of her menstruating. And if they do so, this is uh, they are going to be obligated. They're going to be chayev. They're going to be liable for a, a, a spiritual excision of some kind, whatever that word means. I'm not quite sure. And the point is that these people who are engaged in these activities, and listen to this, says the Gemara, Mutarim They are permitted to read the Torah, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Kusuvim, and the writings. That's very strange. Aren't these people also in a state of impurity? And certainly when you speak about the Zavim, they had a seminal emission. And when we speak about a person who had relations with the Nida, isn't he also involved in this emission from his body? He's going to become ritually impure. Nevertheless, the Gemara says, Mutarim li cross patero benevim because of him. Lishnot ben Mishnah over Gemara over Halachot over Agadot. He can study the Mishnah and the Gemara and the Halachot and the Agadot. He can study all the laws and he can and he can read all the Agadot inside the Gemara. There's a whole world of Agadot. Those who are interested in learning more about the Agadot and they want to strip the Gemara of all the Halacha and learn only the Agadah. You can buy yourself a beautiful set of books today known as the Ein Yaakov. And today you have a very beautiful edition which, which even elaborates on it in great detail to make it come to life and be easy to understand. Hamavuar, there's a beautiful edition called the Ein, Ein Yaakov Hamavuar. And by reading through that edition, one can come to learn all the story side, all the homiletics of the Torah, all the Agadita of the Gemara. So you can learn the Halakha, the laws, you can learn the Agadah. Aval in Asurin. Ah, but if a person is a Balkiri, is forbidden. How, what is the difference between the Balkiri and these people? Take a look at this note here. The reason for this distinction is that the cases of severe impurity are caused by ailments or other circumstances beyond his control. And as a result, they do not necessarily preclude a sense of reverence and awe as he studies Torah. Meaning even the fellow who was intimate with Anita, we hope that the intimacy that he had with her was uh, mistaken. And therefore he thought that she was permitted but he found out afterwards she wasn't because she was bleeding. Uh, the moment that he, he left her, the moment he, he left her, he realized she was bleeding. And he realized that he was intimate at the time of her nida. Well, when he engaged in the particular Avera that he was engaged in, he, he wasn't doing it in a, in, in a manner that shows frivolity, but rather in a manner of being intimate, of fulfilling some, talk, some type of a mitzvah, we hope. And, and therefore, he wasn't acting in a frivolous manner. This, however, is not the case with regard to impurity resulting from a seminal emission. 
which usually comes about due to frivolity and a lack of reverence and awe. Therefore, it is inappropriate for one who experiences a seminal emission to engage in matters of Torah, of in Torah. Well, I think that could be a typing error. Okay, let us con let us read the halakha. Zavim and lepers are permitted to read the Torah, but those who experience a seminal emission are prohibited from doing so. Everyone who is ritually impure is permitted to read, ritually impure is permitted to read the Torah, recite Shema, and pray, except for those who experience a seminal emission, as Ezra decreed that they are prohibited to do so until they immerse in a ritual bath, meaning a mikvah. However, in subsequent generations, that ordinance was repealed, and one who experienced a seminal emission was permitted to engage in all those activities without immersion or bathing in nine cup of water, which we're going to learn about in just a moment. That remains the prevalent custom brought down by the Rambam over there in the Shulchan Aruch, etc. Bottom line is that we see if a man does have a seminal emission, and it doesn't really matter how it happens, at the end of the day, he is still permitted to engage in the study of Torah, and so he should, as we're going to see a little bit later. But the, the idea is that if we were to exclude a man today from engaging in the study of Torah because of this Balkari story and the Takana of Ezra HaSofer, this decree of Ezra the scribe, well, what would happen to us then basically is that if we were being honest with ourselves, most men would not study much Torah at all. They come with all sorts of excuses as to why now they're not going to study. And the rabbi would say to them, well, did you go to the mikveh? He'd say, rabbi, the mikveh's too far. I'm working all day. I don't have time. The mikveh's too cold. The mikveh was locked. It's too expensive. And of course, people would not engage in the study of Torah. So in today's times, the takana of Ezra, though it stands, and those who wish to be stringent upon themselves, tavu alav bracha, he should be blessed for doing so. But nevertheless, our custom today is that even though that is the case, we do not go to the mikvah for those who can't. Those who can should go indeed every single day. Rabbi Yesi Omer, by the way, in any case, whether or not a person did have the uh, seminal emission, he should still go to the mikvah every single day. If he can't, he should go once a week on Erev Shabbos. And uh, if he can't do that, well, at least he should try to go maybe even Erev Rosh Chodesh at least once a month if he can. If he can't do that, at least, of course, on Erev Rosh Hashanah, Erev Yom Kippur, provided, of course, he knows that it's healthy and there are no problems of any sicknesses coming about as a result of that. As those people know today, uh, with a sickness going around, a virus going around, one must be careful, one must be cautious, one must know what is the halakha, one should ask one's rabbi if it's if it's appropriate to go to the mikvah every single day in today's times what about if people are hanging around standing by the mikvah could it be considered healthy to be around all these people all the time each person should ask their own rabbinical authority what is the best thing to do and should follow in accordance with that custom it's important to be healthy and um, when all the sickness will be over Bezrat Hashem soon that there's no more virus we can go back to a life whereby we feel more comfortable Bezrat Hashem it should be that way so that we don't have to worry about these things and be concerned you can go to the mikvah and feel quite relaxed that we're not going to get ill in any way whatsoever vaccine not vaccine the, the main thing is that there shouldn't be a virus that we should be catching that as a result of that we could be sick and then we can continue our lives and go to the mikvah as often as we want to Okay, let us continue. Rabbi Yosei Omer, Rabbi Yosei says, Sheinehu Birigilios, a person, even though he's a Balkiri, he may study in a regular manner. He may do his studies as he would generally do. Or Bilvad Shelo Yatsiya is a Mishnah. And on condition, of course, that he does not elaborate on the Mishnah. There's a difference between studying the Mishnah and elaborating the Mishnah. Studying the Mishnah refers to simply reading it, like we did at the beginning of the Shi'ur. You just read through the Mishnah and you say, oh, that's what it is, nice. But if you're going to elaborate on it, so you're taking things one step further, so they're already, according to Rabbi Yesei, you should not expound, elaborate on the words of the Mishnah. Just simply recite the Mishnah as it is. You know, with over 4,300 odd Mishnayot, there's plenty to study, even if a person is a Balkiri, there's plenty to get through, even if you don't go into much depth to work through all those Mishnayot. Rabbi Yonasan ben Yosef Omer, Rabbi Yonasan, the son of Yosef, says the following. Listen to this. Matsiya hu esa Mishnah. He may elaborate on the Mishnah. No problem. Good news. We can open up a Kahati Mishnayot 
or Rabovadia Mi Bartonora or the Tosafot Yom Tov, we can read the commentary, no problem. Matsia, who eta Mishnah? You can elaborate upon the Mishnah. The Eno Matsia Gemara, but don't elaborate on the Gemara. Don't get stuck into all the arguments, but learn the Mishnah on a slightly deeper level. Rabbi Nasan bin Avishalom Omer, Rabbi Nasan, the son of Avishalom, says, Af Matsia Gemara, good news. Rabbi Nasan bin Avishalom says, that one may indeed elaborate on the Gemara, or bilvad, on condition, on condition that he will not recite God's names, Askarot, the Askara, and Askara refers to one of God's names. As long as he doesn't say God's name from his lips, it's okay to study the Gemara. Fantastic, good news. Thank you very much, Rabbi Nasan, Ben Shalom, for that opinion. Rabbi Yochanan Sandala. Now, Rabbi Yochanan, the uh, shoemaker, the, the, the cobbler, he said the following, Talmud Oshel Rabbi Akiva, he was the pupil of Rabbi Akiva, and he said, Mishum Rabbi Akiva, in the name of his teacher, Rabbi Akiva, he said, Omer, he says, Lo yikanes lemidrash kolikar. Hold on a second, bad news. He may not involve himself in the study of midrash, which is the homiletics, really, the drush of the Torah. He may not do it. Call the car, not at all. For Omrila, some say that really what he said is not like that. Some say not that he can't enter into the Midrash, into studying Midrash, the homiletical part of the Torah, the storyline. Lo yikanes levaita midrash kol ikar. He should not enter into the bait midrash at all. Don't go to shul. They said they did, his words weren't don't study Midrash. His words were don't enter into the Beit Midrash. Nobody heard him correctly. They uh, lost out on a couple of words that he said. But what he was saying is don't go into shul. Stay at home and just study Torah by yourself privately. That's what he was saying. Don't go to the, the base Midrash at all. Or maybe he was saying don't go to the base Midrash to study altogether. Maybe that's what he was saying. Uh, one or the other. Maybe he wants to say don't walk into a Beit Midrash. Or maybe he wants to say don't walk into the Beit Midrash to involve yourself in any type of study, which means don't study. I'm not quite sure what he wants to say, but certainly you may not go into the base midrash. Fine. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda said, guess what? Sheine who be hilfos derech eretz. He can study the halakhos of derech eretz. That means to say he can learn these hilfos derech eretz, whatever, whatever the halakhos are with regards to derech eretz, the way of the land, whatever that means, the way of the land, the laws of improving oneself as a human being, whatever we're speaking about, he can learn all of those things. So in any, way, any case, we see over here, in terms of the problem raised above, apparently, Rabbi Yehuda considers the legal status of the blessings to be parallel to the legal status of Hilchus Derek Eretz. And therefore, one may utter them orally. Ah, oh, so that was the whole idea. The whole idea, of course, is Rabbi Yehuda says that he may study the laws of Derek Eretz. And since he regarded the brachot and all the things that we learned about as being in the same category of Derek Eretz, he may also recite those things out aloud. And therefore, we see and we saw that Rabbi Yehuda did not hold by Hirhur. He did not hold by thought. He said that one may indeed say those words. And he was referring to this bracha over here, referring to the idea that it corresponds to the halachot of Derek Eretz. And now we continue in the Gemara. My say, a story. We've reached the stories now. It's a good time to get into some action. But Rabbi Yehuda Shirakiri, guess what? Rabbi Yehuda himself, the great rabbi, he had a seminal emission. And he saw it. Now, I don't know how the story happens. I can tell you straight out. I have no idea how the story happened. But the Gemara mentions it. So we have to read it. It seems to be that the pupils knew exactly what's going on. And how this happens, I really don't know. But nevertheless, this is the story. Rabbi Yehuda Shira Akeri, he saw a seminal emission on himself. And it turned out that he was walking along the back of the river. He's walking along the, the river bank. He's walking along the river bank. He realizes that he had a seminal emission. Again, I don't know how this happened exactly. But this is what the Gemara says. Amrulo Talmidav, his students said to him, and the students must have known what's going on over here. How they knew, I had no idea. Rabbeinu, our rabbi, our teacher, do us a favor, please, and teach us a chapter of the laws of Derek Eretz. Why were they saying that? Because, of course, they knew that even though he was in a state of ritual impurity, even he himself admits he could still teach and study the laws of Derek Eretz. So while they're on the way, 
They might not be able to, uh, to study any other Torah, but at least let them study some Derek Eretz. What did Rabbi Yehuda do? He went down and he immersed. He was, remember, he was on the riverbank. So he immersed and then afterwards he taught them. So he went into the water, he immersed himself, he purified himself, and afterwards he went and he taught them. What's the problem in the story? Amrulo, they said to him, Isn't it true that such uh, our teacher has taught us that that even a person who had a seminal emission can certainly study the laws of Derek Eretz. So therefore, Rabbi Yehud is very strange of you. You're the one who taught that a person who has a seminal emission, you can still teach the laws of Derek Eretz. And yet when we said to you, please teach us the laws of Derek Eretz, you went and immersed before you came to teach. It sounds like you're contradicting yourself. Well, which one is it? Do you have to immerse or don't you? So he said to them, even though it's true, I'm lenient upon others, which means as far as I'm concerned, others may engage in the study of Derek Eretz without going to the mikvah. I am strict upon myself. So in other words, as far as I'm concerned, as the posik involved in the question, for me, I'm going to be strict. And this is a very interesting idea, of course, Many rabbis hold by this, and it is certainly permitted, and as we learn in various Musa works, it's a, a great trait to have, is that even though the rabbi himself will find what to be lenient for the members of the community to be involved in, as far as he's concerned for himself, he takes the strict approach. It's not that he wants to contradict himself, God forbid, and it's not that he wants to say, oh, you plebs down there, you can take the lenient view, but me, I'm such a great righteous individual, I take the strict view. If, if I had it in my power, I would tell you all to take the strict view. This is not correct. Rather, what we mean to say is that the rabbi doesn't want to inconvenience people who may not be as devoted, as strong, and as committed to observing various laws, and he wants to make sure that they get satisfaction from what they're doing, they're not pulled off the path, and they can cope with the load that is imposed upon them. And therefore, he will look for ways to find the leniency to help them so that they can feel that they belong, they can feel that they are growing, they can feel secure, they know that they're doing the right thing, they're doing God's will just as what the tourist says. But as far as he's concerned, he wants to be extra cautious, and therefore he takes the strict opinion. So Rabbi Yehuda was taking the strict opinion and he was telling his pupils that as far as he's concerned, everybody else can take the lenient opinion. All is well, everything is fantastic. Let us see what's going on here. I'm strange with myself. We look at the notes. Rabbi Yehuda followed the path of those sages who, although they ruled leniently with regard to a particular halakha and instructed the public accordingly, they did not rely upon that leniency themselves. And in doing so, at times, placed themselves in danger. They did so because they held their colleagues and their opinions in such high regard. Very nice idea. Tanya, the Gemara continues. It was taught in a brighter, meaning to say, another teaching, it's like a Mishnah, except that it's not a Mishnah because it wasn't included in the Mishnah. But it's at least it still carries that same type of weight. It's a very strong teaching. Rabbi Yehuda ben Beseira Haya Omer. Rabbi Yehuda, the son of Beseira, was accustomed to say, he would say, the words of Torah do not receive impurity. Ah, that means to say, when a person engages in study of Torah, he can't make Torah impure. Torah is Torah. Torah is pure. If Torah is pure, how can it be because I'm impure, I affect the words of Torah? Does it make any difference to the words of Torah because I'm impure? The words of Torah cannot accept any type of impurity. My seb talmidechad. There's a story told about a particular student, stories time. Shahayama gum game Lamaila, the Rabbi Yehuda bin Beseira, he was stuttering in above Rabbi Yehuda bin Beseira, which means he went to Rabbi Yehuda bin Beseira and he began, he wanted to say some Torah over whatever it was, but he realized he was in a state of impurity and he had this problem because maybe he shouldn't engage in the study of Torah. As a result, the words didn't come out very nicely, and you don't know what to say exactly. You can imagine he's a little bit uh, fearful. Maybe he shouldn't say these things. And as a result, he couldn't really express himself properly. Omalei, so Rabbi Yehuda ben Beseira uh, said to him, Bni, my son, Psachpika, open your mouth, Vyairu Devarecha, beautiful words, and let your words 
be il illuminate. Open your mouth and let your words come out. It's interesting. I'm just giving an, an interest, interesting in insight over here. But if one reads the works of Rabbi Abraham Abulafia, the great teacher of the um, mystical Kabbalah, of ecstatic Kabbalah, how he uses the same expression of the idea of when a person is ascending and he wants to meditate, he, he wants to get himself in a very high level of ascent as he meditates, he uses the same expression about uh, attaining this level where he says, let the words come out of your mouth, uh, let, 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 open up your mouth and let the words illuminate, let the words, words illuminate, let your words come out with illumination. When you're engaged in the study of Torah, when you're engaged in coming close to Hashem, the words mustn't be stuffy. The words mustn't be heavy. The words must be beautiful. The words must come out and express themselves with light. That is how one achieves closeness to Hashem. When one is engaged in the study of Torah and one feels the words and they are light, you can see the letters ascending. You see the movement of the spiritual aspect of these physical letters ascending above. You know you're on the right track. This is how one studies Torah. This is how one engages in meditation. And one comes close to Hashem by expressing oneself in a beautiful way. Even when one learns Torah, when one teaches Torah, all the time the words that are coming out should be beautiful words. They should be expressing the beauty of Torah, the beauty of the soul, the beauty of God. If not, you're on the wrong path. So Omar lay, so he says to him, do this. Why? Because the words of Torah do not accept impurity. They cannot become impure. There's a great principle. Don't give up ever on the words of Torah because the words of Torah are all pure and have a tremendous effect on the soul. Whatever we do, no matter what, we cannot affect that purity of the Torah. Oh, I, I contradict myself a little bit. I told the story about the person who is not quite so good. He's a weed and you put the water on, it becomes a bigger weed. That's true. But ultimately, if a person is at least uh, uh, tuning himself up just a little bit to work on himself, then don't feel low. Don't feel as if everything is falling apart. Let the words of Torah come out and they will illuminate ourselves and they will illuminate everything around us. How do we know that the words of Torah do not accept any impurity? They do not acquire impurity because the verse says, he has the proof. Hello, Kotavari, Kaesh, the Umashem. Surely my word, my, my word is like fire, says God. Just as it is that fire cannot accept impurity, it just burns it up, so to speak. The fire cannot become impure. There's, there's nothing that it they, they can come into fire, in contact with fire, make the fire impure. After Torah, a nun mekablim tuma. So, to the words of Torah, do not become impure. They do not become ritually impure. Let us take a look here at the notes on the side. Matters of Torah do not become ritually impure. The statement does not contradict the prohibition against reciting matters of Torah in a filthy place. The distinction is that ritual impurity is intangible and is experienced intellectually. Since the words of God are like fire, they do not become ritually impure. However, filth offends the senses and creates a clear impression that one is in a despicable place. Uttering matters of Torah there would fall under the rubric of, for he has shown contempt for the word of the Lord. We're going to learn in our next Mishnah when we get there eventually about the concept of pr praying in a place where there is dirt. Of course, it is forbidden to pray in a place where there's dirt. So you'll say to me, oh, but doesn't it say that the words of Torah don't accept any impurity? So what's it going to do with the dirt? Yeah, but there's a difference. The difference is that when we're in an impure place, meaning that there's dirt, you know, doggy do, all sorts of things like that, the baby's nappy is lying about, I don't know, whatever it is, when we're surrounded by the dirt, we actually are smelling, we're in touch with that dirt, uh, we look at it, uh, we feel a little bit uncomfortable, and therefore it is not appropriate to engage, of course, in words of terror there, but if we're in a state of ritual impurity ourselves, and we, but, our, but that doesn't change anything, because as long as it is clean in the room, the words of terror are not going to uh, become in any way impure. Okay, let us take a look now. So we just read that. Uh, we just read that thing. Personalities. Who was Rabbi Yehuda ben Bateira? The Bnei Bateira, the Bnei Bateira family, produced renowned sages over several generations. Some members of the family served as Nasi during the time of Hillel, but transferred the position to him. 
It is almost certain that there were two sages named Yehuda ben Betera. The second may have been the grandson of the first. Both lived in the city of Netzvin in Babylonia. One, while the temple was still standing, and the second at the end of the Taniatic period. The Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera, whose teaching is cited here, is most likely the second one. He was one of the greatest Torah scholars of his age and organized the study of Torah throughout Babylonia before the great yeshivas were established. He was venerated by the sages of Eretz Yisrael. Okay, so, so far up until here, all is well. We see that the words of Torah do not acquire any type of impurity upon them. And therefore, even if a person is in a state of uh, ritual impurity, certainly according to Rabbi Yehuda ben Becerra, don't worry, just carry on studying Torah. Our mission is to study Torah. Okay, you're in a state of impurity. Go to the mikvah. You can't go to the mikvah. Okay, study Torah. Don't worry. Eventually, the Torah will get inside oneself so much that one will feel like, for example, if a person is playing in the mud, if at a certain point in time, and this is an unusual individual, at a certain point in time when he's playing in the mud, he looks at himself, he says, oh, I look pretty dirty. I'm pretty filthy. I better take a shower. Well, the same thing happens to a person if he's, he's working on himself spiritually, then what happens is he's, he's in a state of ritual impurity. But eventually, when he starts to work on himself and he's studying Torah, he starts to realize the ritual impurity. He becomes uh, he aware of the ritual impurity. He feels it, so to speak. And he says to himself, you know, it's, it's time I get to the mikvah. And he pushes himself and, he, and off he goes to the mikvah. So if it seems at this point in time, the person is ritually impure, he can't go to the mikvah yet, don't worry, study some Torah. After he's studying enough Torah, a person will see the need to go to the mikvah, and he'll bring himself to go to the mikvah. Again, everything should be done in balance. Everything, a person should be balanced when he does it. He should, and especially in today's times now, he should be aware, can he go to the mikvah? Should he go to the mikvah with the situation of the virus, etc.? It's important to know, medically speaking, is he in a state, in, in, a, in, in will he be healthy there? He doesn't want to get sick and afterwards complain that the reason he got sick is because he went to the mikvah and uh, therefore he contracted this the virus. He met a person there who had the virus and so on and so forth. Everything should be done in balance and one should ask a competent halakhic authority what is the best thing to do under the circumstances. Omar Mar, the master, said in the brighter, Matziya eta Mishnah, the eno Matziya eta Gemara. A person can elaborate on the Mishnah, but do not elaborate on the Gemara. Remember, that's what we said earlier. Now, the Gemara says, this is Messiah Elay, the Rabbi Elai. This is a an, an, an aid, it's going to help for Rabbi Eli. This teaching that we learned here in the Brighter is actually a helpful aid to one of the teachings of what Rabbi Eli said. To Omar Rabbi Eli, because Rabbi Eli said, Omar Rabbi Acha Bar Yaakov, that Rabbi Acha Bar Yaakov said, Mishum Rabbeinu, in the name of Rabbeinu. Rabbeinu uh, Rav. Rabbeinu here is Rav. He said in the name of Rav. Halacha, the halacha is, Matziya eta Mishnah, the eno matziya eta Gemara. A person may elaborate on the Mishnah, but don't elaborate on the Gemara. Now, here we said, the master had said in the brighter, matziya eta Mishnah, the eno matziya eta Gemara. This teaching is a help for what Rabbi Eli said, because look what he said. He said the same story. He said, one may elaborate on the Mishnah, but don't elaborate on the Gemara. Ketana A, this is similar to a similar, a, a, a similar argument that was had amongst the Tanaim, we're talking about the Amoraim who had this particular discussion. And now we say the Tanaim, the rabbis that, pre, that predated the Amoraim, had the same story happen to them. What did they say? Mishnah, one may elaborate upon the Mishnah. But don't, you may not elaborate on the Gemara. Divre Rabbi Meir, these are the words of Rabbi Meir. He said you can elaborate the Mishnah, don't elaborate the Gemara. Rabbi Yehuda ben Gamliel Omer. Rabbi Yehuda ben Gamliel says, Mishum Rabbi Hanine ben Gamliel, in the name of Rabbi Hanine ben Gamliel, Ze ze asur. This and that one is prohibited. And some people say that the teaching was not like that. The teaching that he was saying was really Ze ze mutar. Every now and again, it seems that there was a teaching that people were not 100% clear about. Some people had heard it a certain way. Some people heard it another way. We weren't quite sure. What's the nafkamina? What's the practical application? We need to go into more depth to know whether practically speaking, if it came out the one way or the other way, we're going to have to know exactly what to do with it. If it won't make a difference at this point in time, then we just leave it as it is. Now, the point is that in this instance, that, that seems to make a big difference. Some say that he heard it. Some say that what they heard is that both cases were forbidden. He should not 
engage in elaborating the Mishnah nor the Gemara. And some say that what he had said is that both of them are permitted. He may engage in the study and the elaboration of the Mishnah and the elaboration of the Gemara also. Rabbi Eli, who was he? The, this page cites two sages named Rabbi Eli. The first, the Rabbi Eli, who makes a statement in the name of Rabbi Acha Bar Yaakov, was an Amoira in Eretz Israel during the generation of Rabbi Yochanan's students. The Rabbi Eli, who makes a statement with regard to the first sharing, who we're going to learn about in a minute, is the Tana, Rabbi Eli the Elder. The students of Rabbi Eli are the great Ben Hirkanus and a father of the famous Tana, Rabbi Yehuda ben Eli. So there were two Rabbi Eli's, as we're going to see in a moment. And the second one, of course, is the Tana. And the, and the, first, the first one we're mentioning is the Amira. The second one we're mentioning is a Tana. That, that's how it happens in the Gemara. In the old days, we, not everybody had a surname, as many people are aware of. So there were a lot of people that had the same first name. And people get confused. Which Rabbi Eli were you talking about? Uh, we have to know exactly who we're talking about in the context of studying a page of Gemara. The more we know, the better. I always tell people that when studying Gemara, Mishnah, when studying about the Rishonim or the Achroinim, when studying Halakha, do yourself a favor and spend a few minutes studying a little bit, if not a lot, about each person who wrote the particular opinion. Because the more that we familiarize ourselves with who these people are, the more we understand where they're coming from, when they lived, how they lived, what happened in their lifetime, why they therefore came to Paskin in certain instances, why they did, or how, in, how it was that they managed to Paskin in certain ways, even though life was very different for them. And they shouldn't necessarily have Paskin that way, and yet they did. So one can learn um, very, very much by just simply studying who's who in the Talmud, who's who of the Rishonim, who's who of the Akhrenim. Very important to do. There are many um, biographies that are written about these people. If one can pick up the biography, which is 200 pages long, go ahead and read it. If not, one can even find out more information on the Wikipedia. Safaria.org now have the opportunity that when you're reading this page on Safaria.org, you can constantly click on the name of a Tana or an Amira. And it will then bring up on the side information about this person. So you know exactly who it is. Very important to do. Good luck. Man to Omar Zevaze Asur. Now, one who says that this one and that one is forbidden, you may not engage in elaborating Mishnah and nor in the Gemara. Karabi Yochanan Asandala is holding like Rabbi Yochanan Asandala, who prohibited it all. Man to Omar Zevaze Mutar. And the one who says that this one and that one is permissible, Rabbi Huda ben Beseira. What did Rabbi Huda ben Beseira say? Rabbi Huda ben Beseira said that the words of Torah do not acquire impurity. They cannot become impure under any circumstances. And therefore, the opinion that said that you may elaborate on the Mishnah and you may elaborate on the Gemara, we're holding in accordance with the same opinion of Rabbi Huda ben Beseira, who said that uh, Rabbi Huda ben Beseira, who said the words of Torah do not acquire impurity. And therefore, one may engage in all areas of Torah, even though one is a Balkiri. We've come a long way in this discussion. The Mishnah started off with the story of the Balkiri, of the Takana of Ezra, as we went further down in the Gemara, the story about the rabbi saying ultimately that Ezra had instituted when a person is ritually impure, a Balkiri, he had a seminal emission, he needs to go to the mikvah. If not, can he study Torah? Can't he study Torah? We've gone backwards and forwards in this discussion. It's a tremendously exciting section. As you see, this is the real Gemara coming out with the give and take, the shakla, the taria of the discussion of is it permitted really to engage in the study of Torah or not? When one is a Balkiri, what should one do? The discussion hasn't yet ended. It's going to continue. We're going to see more about this in the next lesson. So please do join me and we're going to see more about it. And then shortly there afterwards, we're going to be moving to the next Mishnah, another exciting Mishnah, another topic following on to the ideas of blessings and prayers and so on and so forth. Thanks very much for joining me. I'm Elia Oshir from Chesed Ve'emet. My website can be found on www.lovingkindness.co. If you've enjoyed this year, got something out of it, even one point, it's sufficient for me uh, to go to a shear and learn even one new thing is fantastic. You walk away, you've got one thing solid, fantastic. If you have enjoyed it, please click on the like button below, the thumbs up to say that you appreciate the shear and have gained something. Please feel free to make a comment below in the comment section. Feel, feel free, of course, to be in touch with me directly on through my website. Just visit the website, send me a, a letter via the an email, via the contact form. I'd be happy to be in touch with you about any aspects of Torah, of Yiddishkeit, of life, of growth. These are the subjects that we discuss here. 
Of course, if you want to learn privately with me, please feel free to be in touch and we can learn together, whether it's the Talmud, whether it's whatever subject that you want to, a, a, a subject of your choice, a time that's suitable for you, get some coffee, get some biscuits, and let's enjoy our learning together. It can really be something very enjoyable. Get a small group together if you want to, and we can all learn together and discuss the various matters as a shiur together. It's also fantastic to do that. I teach soft root. Those who want to learn to write their own mezuzahs, please feel free to be in touch with me more about that. And uh, I give shiurim also to young men or even older men who would like to update their knowledge about the laws of nida, of taras amishpacha, family purity, preparing for marriage and valuing the laws involved in a married life. Anyway, in the meantime, uh, I also ask you, please do share this video with family and friends. We're trying as much as possible to get our message out there, to share more Torah and to find more people who will help us and support us in the activities that we're involved in. You can help us by sharing these videos and informing them that, letting them know, encouraging them that we need your support. So please feel free also, if you are able to come through to the website, become a partner in our activities by becoming a regular giver once a month, if you can offer a small donation, whatever you can give, it's a really a great help to us, makes a big difference to us, and it will help us to be able to do more Torah, to give over ourselves more, and, uh, and engage in more of these activities that we're doing over here. Again, thanks for joining me. I look forward to another Shi'ur in the near future, and I uh, wish you everything of the best. Keep well. Take care. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye.